Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians 2, verse 14. We're going to read about five verses today. We're going to read verses 14 through 18. Ephesians 2, chapter 14. If you're there, say amen. Amen. Paul writing, he says, For he is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby came and preached peace to you which were afar off and to them that were nigh for through him we both have access by one spirit unto the father won't you pray with me tonight heavenly father we once again thank you god for this opportunity that you've given us lord i ask that you god that you send a that you send an energy through this house god a readiness for us to receive from your word lord i ask that you send a spirit of clarity in this congregation god anoint my lips that i may properly minister through your word what you'd have me say how you'd like me to say it god i ask that you once again god i ask that you anoint each of us that we may receive from this service what you'd have us receive and we say all of this in the name of the lord jesus christ amen amen Amen. jesus christ has made peace between sinful man sinful man and god christ has made peace in this gap christ has built the bridge between god and man This is something that we all know. What I'm going to be preaching about today is not something that any of us are not familiar with already. The fact of the matter is that Christ has made unity between us and God, and he's even made unity for the body of Christ. And that's that's the title of my message tonight, Christ Our Peace. When I say our peace, that's not talking about really what Paul talks to the Philippians about, a peace that surpasses all understanding, a peace of mind, as having to do with contentment. But this peace has to do more so with the settling of a conflict, that kind of a peace. This peace that Paul is talking to these Ephesians about, it doesn't have to do with contentment as much as it has to do with unity. Peace with God. That's what you and I have. And with peace with God, Christ has given us at least access and ability to have peace with one another, regardless of whatever your brother and sister in Christ, regardless of whatever their background could have been, regardless of what their ethnicity, their race, uh, whether they are a man or a woman, regardless of any of these things, there is a, there at least is access that we have to have perfect unity in this Christian faith. And that unity is much like the unity we have with God. It's on the basis of the blood of Jesus Christ. Christ's sacrifice has given us perfect unity with God and with each other. Just as we got saved by the grace of God through our faith, that is how we live out this life. And just as we got saved, that way that we got saved is the same way that we accomplish Christianity. Maybe accomplished for lack of a better word, but that is how we live this Christian life, by grace through faith. By the grace of God, through our willing faith in Christ and what he's done. And that's our source for unity as well. The Holy Spirit has come into your life and into my life to change us, to make us into the person that God wants us to be, to conform us into the image of Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit is, as Paul would say, renewing our minds. He is making us into Christians. 
It's not our job to make ourselves into Christians. It's our job to continually have our faith planted in Christ Amen. because that's what the Holy Spirit works through our faith on the basis of the grace of God. That's how Christianity happens. There's no other way that you're going to experience biblical Christianity other than that simple principle by grace through faith. This is the relationship between God and his people. God gives grace, we give faith. Grace, faith, grace, faith. And with this changing power that the Holy Spirit does to each of us comes the desire to want unity in the body of Christ. Comes the desire uh, and really the open door for us to walk through, again, for lack of a better phrase, to embrace this unity that Christ has given the body of Christ. This does not call for willful ignorance, uh, blind unity. This does not mean that you and I ought to feel comfortable around everybody who says they're a Christian or every building that says they are a Christian church. Whenever I lived in Louisiana, there were many churches on the campus of Louisiana State University. But let me tell you this, most of them were not godly. I could tell just judging by the names of most of these churches that they did not support the gospel. And therefore, it's odd because in a more, and I don't mean this politically, in a more liberal style church, unity is such a big thing. And yet you will never find a bigger dividing body than in most of the progressive churches today. There is no more division that is happening to the so-called body of Christ than what is coming out of this movement that it calls itself progressive Christianity. And most of this centers itself around the idea that it doesn't matter really what you do, who you have your faith in, where your faith is, period, how you live your life. You know, we're all on different roads to the same destination. That's not what Jesus said. Jesus said that broad is the way, wide right. is the way that leads you to destruction, and straight is the way, narrow is the gate that leads to righteousness, that leads to eternal life. It is a very specific way that God wants all of his people to go through. And that being said, everybody who approaches God through that way, they're approaching God by the same way, and therefore that is a source of great unity for the body of Christ. Are they approaching God by the blood of Christ, by faith in Christ and what he's done for us? Then by definition, they are a Christian. They are a child of God. There are secondary issues that we can have discussions over, secondary issues that are not heaven or hell issues, issues like what could a dress code for a church be? Things like that. Uh, the date of the rapture. Not the actual date, but the whole does it happen before or after. We believe here that it, the rapture happens before the great tribulation. But you should not call somebody's salvation into question if they believe differently than you Amen. for things like that. Amen. Here's how you tell. Here is at least how you can best figure out on your end of things if somebody is a brother or a sister in Christ. Do they believe not only in one true God, but do they believe in Jesus Christ and his finished work at the cross as the source of their salvation? Do they believe that Jesus Christ not only is the risen Son of God who died for the sins of man at the cross, but have they embraced that? Have they surrendered their life under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. If they have, by definition, they are saved. That's what it takes for a man to be saved. It does not mean that they have to look the way that you and I do. It does not mean, as it regards secondary issues, issues that just are not as important as uh, salvation, it does not mean that they have to agree with every last thing that I agree with, for all I know, there are things that they might believe that I would disagree with that I'm wrong on and that I need to correct as it regards to aligning with what they believe. But if we both believe that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life for salvation, 
then by definition, we are children of God. And anybody who affirms Christ as the Savior of the world, the Son of the living God who died and rose from the dead, who ascended back to the Father and sent down the Holy Spirit, anybody who affirms the Bible as God's book, as the source of truth, the, the basis of all things true, Although I may have disagreements with this kind of person, I should not do so as to distance myself from them the same way that I would distance, my, distance myself from a blatant sinner. Because if they're in Christ, their status is not sinner. Yeah, we might still struggle with sin after we get saved, but our, our status, the Bible says that we are joint heirs with yeah, Jesus yeah. Christ. Yeah. That's our status. By grace through faith. The gospel is for everybody. It's not just for one group or two groups or three groups. It's for everybody. God has opened up this message to every tribe, every tongue, every nation in the world has been exposed. At least every continent for sure has been exposed to the gospel of Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter what culture or look these different people might have throughout the world. All countries have been exposed. All places have been exposed to the gospel. And if there is such thing as a place out there, a nation out there that hasn't been exposed to it, then God will see to it that that nation is exposed to the gospel because yes. the gospel is for the whole world. Amen. It's not just for one group. The gospel is for everybody. In this sense, what Paul is talking about here in Ephesians 2, the gospel is for both the Jew and the Gentile. Paul is saying here that the Gentile world has been exposed to the reality and benefits of the cross of Christ, just like the Jews have been. These were necessary truths to preach in the first century church because of the common prejudice between Jews and Gentiles. The fact of the matter is that God has made everyone equal at the foot of the cross. And let me tell you something, this isn't an issue that just Paul had to deal with. Even today, I was thinking about it before church, um, the United States, people call us a melting pot of just everybody. And it's weird because the division, more often than I'd like to admit, due to racial issues in this country is absolutely ridiculous. And listen, I think it's time that some people in this world just grew up a little bit uh, and realized that anybody can be racist. Not just one skin color of people. Anybody can be racist. Anybody can be prejudiced against somebody else because they don't look like them. Anybody can be that. And we've seen, we have seen a lot of racism from a lot of different people in this country, particularly over the last few years. And it's pride, it's arrogance. At the end of the day, there are many people, there's a group out there, they call themselves the Hebrew Israelites. I don't know if you ever heard of them. Uh, some, uh, some people call them the Black Hebrew Israelites. It is a... It is a religion. I don't even really know what their beliefs is. Their beliefs are so unorganized, but they they are it's a religion that has been around, I suppose, for the last thirty years, forty years, or something like that. It's ba it bases itself in African American pride. And the idea is that African Americans are really God's chosen people, not the Jews of the Middle East, but everybody from Africa or in Af whoever is an African American. And they believe that uh, obviously Jesus was a black man and that black people are God's chosen people. And they use this as this very prideful way to boast, this, to boast in themselves above other people, specifically white people. They view white people as descendants of the devil. I'm not joking that we are descendants of Satan himself because of all of the oppression that white people have given black people. This is what they say. One group in the black Hebrew Israelites believe that when Jesus comes back, he's going to enslave all of the white people. I guess it's payback or however you want to put it. And that every white person is going to get at least a thousand lashes with a whip every day. 
It's a violent, aggressive, ungodly group that bases just about everything they believe on their skin color, and it's no better than the Ku Klux Klan, if I'm going to be honest with you. But this is how humanity thinks. The Jews really thought that they were better than everybody because they were Jews. If I'm a Jew. Jesus literally, I, I talked with a friend about this a couple days ago. Jesus literally had to correct this when somebody approached him saying, well, we're, descend we're, we're not bound by anybody. We're descendants of Abraham. We're Abraham's seed. We've never been bound by anybody. Never mind the fact that they were bound like once, twice, three, four times throughout history. Uh, another empire occupied their land, but whatever. They said, we're descendants of Abraham. We're not in bondage. Jesus looked at them and says, anybody who sins is in bondage. Anybody who sins. The Jews did not like the Romans specifically, and the Romans did not like the Jews either. The Romans saw the Jews as revolutionaries. They saw the Jews as just this big, this big inconvenience for the empire because the Jews had multiple times tried to throw revolts against Rome. And even during Jesus' time, there were many Jews who were ready. They would walk around with this sheath wrapped around their ankle with a little dagger that they could pull out at any moment should a random insurrection take place against Rome. And the, Rome, the Roman people just saw the Jews as violent, aggressive. Uh, if they could, they would wipe Romans out off the face of the earth. And the Jews hated the Romans because they viewed the Romans, every Roman person, as just someone who came in, conquered their land, and really just a lot of ridiculous stuff. And between the Jews and the Romans specifically, there was this big hostile relationship because of ethnicity, because of race, things like that. Martin Luther, as a matter of fact, who was not around for the Roman Empire years, years after Rome's time, you know, if you know about Martin Luther and how well God used this, this man, you cannot deny the impact that God had through Martin Luther with the Protestant Reformation for the body of Christ and also for the whole world, how God through this man would start Debatably, the most important revival in history and directed so many people all over the world back to faith in Christ. It was incredible how God used this man. But this anti-Jew sentiment that the Romans would pick up during their time would be carried in Europe for years upon end. And even Martin Luther, during his ministry, would teach himself kind of to hate the Jews because in his eyes, the Jews were the ones who killed Jesus. And that... that he planted it himself with that, this very anti-Semitic attitude against the Jews. And by the end of his life, he basically hated the Jewish people. And this anti-Semitic attitude would carry all the way up until Nazi Germany and Europe. So you have the Jews who hate the Gentiles. You have these Gentiles who hate the Jews. A message like what Paul is saying here would have been very necessary for this time. And it has been necessary in many countries ever since Paul's time as well, including our own. Because people think that they're so big and bad because they're born to look a certain way. Friend, listen to me. If anybody continues in that line of thought, that pride will drag them straight to hell. That's right. And they'll learn just how unspecial they were because of their skin color. Anybody who approaches God with favor upon them can only do so by passing through the blood of Jesus yeah. Christ. Amen. And and that opportunity is equal for everybody. God does not have one group of people closer to him than another group of people. That's not how this works. Everybody has to approach God by the same way, and they are drawn just as equally close to God should they approach God by the right way that he chooses to be approached by. You had the Gentile world which was exposed to the reality and benefits of the cross, just like the Jews. Paul would say in Galatians 3, verses 26 through 28, very famous passage of scripture, he would say to these people, for you are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. 
In other words, as many of you who have been saved, you are saved, and that's the end of it. The Jews don't have to do something extra to get into a relationship with God, and neither do the Gentiles. If you have Christ, you have Christ, and that's the end of it. He says that there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And this passage of scripture doesn't have to do with what God has called you to do in his kingdom, and it has everything to do with your status as a Christian. That's what this is about. In other words, if you're a Jew, you can draw close to God. If you're a Greek or any Gentile, you can too draw close to God. If you're a slave, you can draw close to God. If you're a free man, you can draw close to God. If you are a man, period, you can draw close to God. If you are a woman, you can draw close to God. As long as you approach him by faith in the blood, God will welcome in anybody into his presence. Yes, amen. We, we hear something along the lines of this quote often in the church world today, and it's usually to compliment somebody's walk with God. We look at our favorite preachers and evangelists, and we say things like, oh, man, they're such a better Christian than I could ever be. I wish I was as close to God as they are. And things like that, you know, it's a good compliment. And there's even biblical, there's even a sense a biblical precedent for that compliment. We read about things like what the Bible says in Proverbs 3, 27, and Romans 13, verse 7. There's always this, there's this constant idea throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament to just show honor, to show respect where it's due, to respect those who have earned respect. And there's nothing insulting or heretical about complimenting somebody's relationship with God by saying things like, wow, I wish... I want to be that close to God. You know, it's a good compliment. But really, in reality, the fact of the matter is that God is not keeping any of his children at any greater distance from himself than he is the rest of the body of Christ. In other words, God has brought everybody equally close to him. Nobody is more distant from God than somebody else. At least it's not God's fault if somebody is like that. Everybody is brought into the presence of God. Everybody is brought near to God. There is no ranking class of Christian in the Bible. This, this goes into the whole issue with how people act about the baptism of the Holy Spirit these days. And I mentioned it this morning. If you haven't received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you're not some second class Christian that God can do less with. That's never taught in the Bible. And it shouldn't be taught in this church. It shouldn't be taught in any church, really. But the fact of the matter is that God does not think less of those of his children who have not received the baptism of the Holy Spirit than he does those who have. God is not keeping a closer eye on those who have spoken in tongues than he is those who haven't. And those who have, he's always going to call them first to go and do something. That's never taught in the Bible, ever. The fact of the matter is this. God is not ashamed to have anybody in this house, in his presence, regardless of whatever the past might have, have in whatever, regardless, regardless if you have found your spiritual gift yet or not, regardless if you have or haven't spoken in tongues or not, regardless of any of that, God is never, ever, ever hesitant to invite anybody into his presence, is the fact of the matter. God's not ashamed to have anybody in his presence. God's not ashamed to have any of his children in his presence. The only instance that I could think about where somebody would truly be removed from the presence of God would be if somebody were to lose their salvation, to be honest with you. Because what did Jesus say about the vine? He says that he talks about the vine being cut off from the tree, from the branch. He says that the vine could be cut off so the only time where God would ever expel somebody from his presence would be in an instant, really, where you would have to renounce your faith in order for God to distance himself. Because he only associates with those who walk by faith in his son. Well, if you walk by faith in his son, you have been made, you have been drawn near to God. God has made his presence totally 
available to those who are saved. All right? And this is the same benefit that all of God's people have. It doesn't matter what country they live in, what background they have, whatever their testimony may or may not look like, all of God's people have access to God. All of his people have this access. In other words, God values you just as much as he does your favorite preacher. As it regards uh, who we think God has a greater appreciation for, if God were to ever have a greater appreciation for anybody who ever walked this earth, it would easily be Christ. But because of Christ's sacrifice, God loves you and I divinely so. Amen. He loves us sacrificially. That's the love that God has for us, for all of us. Whoever wrote Hebrews would write in chapter 4, verses 14 through 16, they would say, Seeing then that we have a great high priest that has passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore... Come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. What I just read to you is something that all of God's people have access to. It's a right that all Christians have to approach the throne room of God boldly. Boldly. Paul, in this passage of scripture in Ephesians 2, he's continuing a line of thought from verses 11, 12, and 13. That these Ephesians who at one point in times past were distant from God, now that they have accepted Christ as Lord and Savior, they have been brought near to God. The same can be said for all of God's people. So the Jew, the Greek, the Ethiopian, it does not matter. The Asian, all, everybody. Everybody who approaches God by faith in Christ's blood, all of these people have been brought near to God. All of God's people are one in Christ. That means that we are all of equal value to God. We all have an equal status with God. We all have access to the same power. We are all equally near to God. We could use work, uh, well, we could work a little bit on our unity, but still, all of God's people have access to God. And the way that Paul is talking about it, he's basically saying that's just the end of the discussion. There's no point really in dwelling on it because all of God's people have access to him. Nobody is allowed to approach God in a different way than somebody else. All of God's people have the same access to the same benefits, not because of anything they've done, but because of what Jesus has done for them at the cross. Yeah. He speaks of a wall of partition. Partition just really is synonymous with separation. I looked it up in the Greek, that word partition, just today. and It's surprisingly a generic word. It doesn't refer to anything specifically, uh, which is a little odd. It sounds so official and dignified, partition. But partition just means separation. And the wall of partition just refers to a wall of separation. This could refer to any wall in any home. It could refer to the wall that separates the men and women's restroom back there. It, it is a wall that separates something. It is a wall that separates something. Well, Christ has broken the separation between Jew and Gentile. We know that in the Old Covenant, the Old Covenant was specifically open to the Jewish people. Gentiles could follow after God. They could offer sacrifices to God if they wanted to, but this covenant relationship was in the Old Covenant between God and the Jewish people. But that divide, that, that uh, how do you put it? That divide, that separation there, as it regards what the Jews had versus what the rest of the world had, Christ has broken that partition. He has sent that partition crumbling to the ground. He's removed that separation. He's removed that separation. And more importantly, Christ has broken the separation between God and mankind. 
So the blood of Christ not only makes peace between the nations, all, all the people all throughout the world who are saved, Christ is not only the source of peace, of unity for the people of God all over the world, but he's also the source of unity and peace between God and all of mankind, period. Christ is the ultimate source of peace. And Paul says in verse 16 that the cross of Calvary is the cause of Christian unity. The cross brought me into the fold, and everybody else who approaches God will have to approach by way of the cross. The same cross that was presented to the Jew first, as Paul would say in Romans 1.16, was then presented to the Gentiles exact same gospel there is no gospel for the Jew and gospel different gospel for the Gentile it was the same message it was the same gospel we are all given the same gospel to work with each and every single one of us the old the young the men the women the black the white everybody the poor the rich everybody everybody is given the same gospel to work with as it regards this Christian life as it regards entering into a relationship with the living God, everybody has the same gospel to work with. There is one gospel, and you either embrace that gospel or you reject it, but it'll be the same gospel that's offered to everybody, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, to the Gentile. It's all because of Jesus. There's one source of everybody's salvation. If anybody wanted to be saved, they would have to go to the same place that everybody who has been saved before them had to go, at the foot of the cross. It's the same place that God invites everybody all over the world to come to spiritually, not physically, but spiritually, by expressing faith in Christ, believing that what he did on the cross is the truth, believing in him as our resurrected Savior. That's the call for the whole world. Nobody is being discriminated. Nobody is being dig being given different a different means of approaching God. It's all the same. It's all because of Jesus. Yes, there is no such thing as different roads leading to the same destination. You either get on this road that leads to this destination or get on this road right. that leads to that destination. Mm -hmm. And you know the idea of the way being straight and narrow that does not have to do with this idea that, oh, not everybody can fit in. That's not what that has to do with. Whosoever will, that is just the truth, is yes. what the Bible says. Oh, yeah. Straight and narrow simply has to do with the fact that this is a very simple and direct way. It's not a way that leads you to confusion. It's not a way that allows you to choose A, B, C, or D. It is one road. It is not a two-lane, four-lane, five-lane highway. It is a one-lane highway. Yes. It is a one-way street, and it takes uh -huh. all, all of you who get on this road to the exact same place. That's what straight and narrow means. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that, ooh, this road can't hold everybody. This road can hold everybody. Yes, the yes, fact yes, is not everybody yes, chooses yes. this road. Because everybody wants to go their own route. Mm -hmm. Everybody wants to take the scenic route to heaven. But there's only one way that God yes. has paved. Amen. And that way has been paved by the blood of his only begotten yes. son. The Lord Jesus Christ. Yes. Amen. It's all because of Jesus. All because mm -hmm. of Jesus. The cross is not only the sin killer. But it is also the source of unity between believers. Christ has given the nations of the world peace with each other through the power of his shed blood. In other words, because, you know, wars and rumors of wars, that's literally the day that you and I live in. And it's a little difficult to think about unity between the nations. The Christians of this world, the saved people, God's children, have perfect unity with one another. The, way, the, the ultimate reason, and you better be careful, some people will call you simple-minded, willfully ignorant if you say something like this, but it's just the truth. The reason why the world is at such great conflict, it'll always be rooted in the fact that, that the world that you and I live in refuses to walk by faith in Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. You and I live in a world that really does think and act like it is self-sufficient and all that it needs. But this world just lives in one lie on top of another. You want true equality? Get to know Jesus. Amen. Jesus is the source of yes. true, true equality. Oh. All right. And this doesn't mean.
seen that everybody is called of God to do the exact same things. Mm -hmm. Everybody has a different purpose in the body of Christ. God calls different people mm -hmm. to do different things. Yeah. Everybody is special in the kingdom of God. But everybody is not special at the same time in the sense of how we got here. Because we all got here by the same way. Yeah. All of us. The blacks, the whites, the Hispanics, the Asians, the Latinos, all of us. It doesn't matter what part of the world you came from, what your background was, what part of town you were raised in. It does not even matter what religion you were raised in. All of us who are in the kingdom of God now, all of us got here the same way. Yeah. All of us got here the exact same way. Christ has given the world the saints of this world peace with each other through the power of his shed blood. And he has given us peace with God through that same blood. Christ is our peace. Yes, he is our peace. Thank the you. Christian should, because of this, strive for peace with fellow believers. Christ has given us peace, and it should be in our best interest to keep that peace. Many Christians today will look at anything that anybody else is doing, and they will see that as a point of strong contempt, or strong contempt between them and the, this other group. There is this one massive divide in the church right now between those who preach the message of the cross, and the, I'm talking about the kind of people who say cross, cross, cross all day, every day between those kinds of people and people who still do cling to the message of the cross, but maybe don't say cross, cross, cross every day of every week. There's a divide going on in the church right now as it regards to that issue. Who, who says cross, 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 blood, 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 and who doesn't? The cross of Jesus Christ is the ministry of the child of God, period. But whenever you look at somebody who does not say cross as often as you do, and you consider this person to be in danger of leaving the gospel, I would just be careful. The worst case scenario there is that you're jumping to conclusions and you are causing division where it does not belong in the body of Christ. Not everybody says cross, cross, cross. Some people say gospel, gospel, gospel. Whenever you make the anointing of God, the ministry of God, all about semantics, and that's another thing you have to look out for when it regards reasons why many Christians choose to be divided with each other, you just need to be careful because you need to look at what these people believe. And if they are your brother in Christ, if we're talking about someone who is a sister in Christ, then we ought to strive for peace with that person because they are in God's family. If they are saved, that is problem priority number one right there. And if they're saved, that is our fellow believer right there. And even though there might be some disagreements that we have with other Christians, it's not a reason to totally isolate ourselves from that part of the body of Christ. And it's definitely not a reason to, to, not, to doubt their salvation. There is a special unity that Christ has given that only the body of Christ has access to. So, having the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit, let's keep that peace in Jesus' name. I know that this message, you know, it wasn't the most uh, spiritual thing that you've ever heard of your life, but really... As I looked over this today, I just don't feel like it was meant to be that way. There's a great practical side to Christianity. Right That's here. just the fact of the matter. There is a lot of Christianity, a lot of this Bible that deals with how you act. There's a lot of this Bible that deals with bringing you back to the basics, that deals with how you live your life, but that's constantly reminding you why it's important to keep your faith in Christ because yeah. nothing else is going to work. Yeah. And this might seem repetitive sometimes. It might seem bland to us sometimes. But the fact of the matter is this. The basics of Christianity are the best of Christianity. Yeah. The gospel of Jesus Christ is the best side of Christianity. Yeah. And everything else that succeeds in Christianity bleeds out from the gospel of Christ. Yeah. So 
So Christ is our Savior. He is our source of sanctification. And he is our source of peace with God and with our fellow believers. Amen. Well, Lord, we thank you for giving us the opportunity, God, to come here tonight. Lord, I pray that there has been some that has there has been something that has been preached tonight that has fallen on good ground, and I pray that there has that there has been a seed planted that is worth growing. God, although there are certain parts of the Bible that us and our finite understanding of things that we would just kind of wish to gloss over and skip through because it may not seem as important to us or because it may seem a little repetitive, God. Uh, reveal to our hearts why every verse in this Bible is important, God. Because we know, God, that this Bible that we have in our hands, that we have in our homes, that this is important. But God, give us the understanding God, for every verse in every chapter, why this Bible is so special. Lord, we thank you. Uh, we thank you that you have sent your only begotten Son down to this earth, God, to make peace uh, between us and you. And we thank you for the peace that flows out from that, that peace that we have with one another. God, where there is no peace in this house, I ask, God, that you send the spirit of peace that there may be restoration in any relationship or friendship that has been broken in your body. And God, I ask that you anoint each of us, Lord, to be keepers of peace among each other, God, among this body that you've established here at Jacksonport. We thank you for all that you do for us, Lord. We ask that you give us a wonderful week, a week of peace, of contentment. Lord, I ask that you anoint us, should the door ever open, to share our faith with somebody, God, and to look for those opportunities as we go throughout this week, Lord, and we just give you all the praise and all the glory and all the honor, and we say this in the name of Jesus.